Welcome to episode three of the GA Performance Podcast. Our guest this week is world-renowned performance coach and kicking guru, Dave Allred. Dave has mastered the skill of performing under pressure, and he's taught it to the likes of Johnny Wilkinson, who he worked with from the age of 16, Johnny Sexton, who he's worked with for over a decade, Bowden Barrett, Roland O'Gara, Horrock Harrington, the Lions team, the English cricket team, Manchester City, the list is endless, and it also includes a number of top GA teams and players. He's the author of the award-winning book, The Pressure Principles, which I highly recommend. And he talked to us about kicking techniques, body language, self-talk, confidence and superficial confidence, the best ways to practice, the ugly zone, what it is, and how to get into it. This masterclass was organized by Sport Endorse for their athletes, and they've kindly now made it available to all listeners of the GA Performance Podcast. I was like a kid in a toy store getting the opportunity to talk to and ask questions of Dave Allred, who I've admired since first reading his book. He is the best in the world at what he does. And if you can learn even this amount of what I did from this chat, it's going to be well worth your time. Enjoy. We'll, we'll, we'll crack straight into it. So um, yeah. the, the, the players, I suppose, that, um, that you've worked with and the teams you've worked with are, are endless. Um, but you're, yourself, you're, you had a, a playing career yourself um, in rugby union and rugby league and, and American football. And ha- I suppose just tell us a little bit of how you got into coaching and your own kind of playing career and where you got started. Well, I, 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 was, I was kind of lucky, really. Um, I, I, and I think uh, a, a lot of people say you must have done a lot of qualifications as coaching. Um, originally, I trained as a school teacher. And uh, I was very lucky, uh, although it didn't feel like it at the time, that my uh, first job was to take over uh, a group of quite uh, disaffected um, 14, 15 year old youngsters. And I had um, I was told, you know, you have 12 periods of mass and English a week, even though I was trained at sport, sport science. And really, if I'm blunt about it, all I was asked to do was to keep them quiet. I learned more about coaching and about interaction and about self-esteem and respect a mutual respect and how to communicate then than I have done in any other time in my life. And, and, and I think that um, I, I kind of putting a flag out here uh, in that um, I think teachers, good teachers, are so undervalued, it's frightening. Um, but because I definitely find that, that my base skills for coaching, getting somebody who is at point A to move them to point B, and, and often I get asked, you know, what is, what is the sign of a really good coach? The sign of a really good coach is somebody that will totally commit to something new and maybe fail at the first, second, third, even fourth attempt, but have no loss of self-esteem. And if you can get that and you've got humility, then that to me is, is gold in coaching. I mean, essentially then I, I trained as a school teacher, then got involved um, in, in sport myself and, and so on and so forth and found that kicking was something that I could do. And then I started um, actually for quite a long time ago with Stuart Barnes and Jonathan Webb um, when we were at Bath. And then I sort of got mixed up with uh, rugby league in Australia, St. George Dragons. It's now St. George Illawarra. Um, And then I came back and got involved in, in rugby league and coached Great Britain with Maurice Banford. And I was just a kind of massive sponge and I believe that every time you coach in an environment, you learn something new and, and it, it sort of just am, amalgamates. And then I did my PhD, which was sponsored by Adidas, um, that they, they paid for it and, and were absolutely outstanding in, in supporting me through those studies, um, which gave me a sponsorship to basically coach professionally and have the time and study. Which was which was a gold mine in, in my own development, and that that academic side of things was that very scientific, um, or was it again kind of on a like you're learning about on a human level, which you already was, kind of it, mastered. Yeah, a really good question. Was it scientific? It's kind of 
um, I suppose there is a science there, but but I the way I was able to do it, and I had an, an absolutely incredible tutor for my PhD, was to actually look at the performance of the individual. So the individual, the, perfor the, the performer was central, and then what were all the strands that affected him? And it was how he learned the skill in the first place. It was his mindset. Uh, you know, is he um, does he fear failure? Um, then there's the mechanics, and then there's a whole thing about how they learn anyway and their learning style. And I tried to encapsulate that, and then I ended up with these principles that I adopted, which is actually, it, it, I know it sounds a bit it's corny, but it's at all nearly the chapters in the book. It's actually how much information can somebody cope with? Um, you know, you can get information overload in the, sometimes the most simple skills. So that was that was a massive uh, learning for me and I had massive encouragement. So it was a real mixture of science and humanities and, and, and psychology uh, because it's the person and the person is an amalgam of everything. Yeah. And it's interesting the kind of your your career. Um, did you intend at the start because you've like you've almost mastered a niche, which I suppose a lot of people are trying to to follow kind of the stuff that you do. You know, your, a performance coach wasn't necessarily around for for everyone when you started. Where you kind of almost created a niche, but did you aim to create a niche? Uh, no, not really. Uh, what actually happened was I, I started coaching. Um, uh, kicking and then I got involved in mindset and how to prepare and bits and pieces and then I had a uh, a long stint with England with Clive Woodward who was massively encouraging about uh, looking at, at new things um, and you you kind of say well what's stopping us getting better in anything we do you know can can we get better at it and without being corny it, it's kind of it it it's it challenges when people say, oh, I, I don't like change, but actually it's evolution. And, and managing that slowly, slow evolution is, is absolutely massive. Um, and I was lucky enough to do that. And then uh, out of the blue, I suddenly got a call from Luke Donald um, in, in uh, Miami. Um, and at the time, I didn't even know who Luke Donald was. I, I thought he was a rugby player, actually. He said, you know, I've, I've heard you work, you know, with mindset and stuff. You know, I wonder if you could give me a hand. And I'm sort of saying, well, yeah, sure. You know, and it wasn't until quite a way through the conversation, I realized he was a golfer. Um, but then I suddenly thought, well, you know, why not? Give it a go. And so we agreed to do a week and see how it goes. And uh, the, the rest is, is history. Two and a half years later, you know, he was, he got to world number one and oh. won the double money list and all the rest of it. And basically it was an attitudinal change and it was trying to get practice to be more accountable than the actual match. And there are all yeah. sorts of things you can do to that to make it really, um, really ugly so that the resilience develops um, and, and then you, you can cope with a lot more when it, when it matters on the course. And, and, and I've, I've, I've um, read interviews with you in the past where you've talked about the athletes who you work with and how that you kind of, you give them a few days kind of to make sure that they have the right kind of mindset before you work with them. And I suppose the player who you're synonymous for, for working with is, um, is Johnny Wilkinson. And like when we, when we talk about athletes, like for me, growing up the athlete who you would look at in terms of mindset and just complete mental strength and a, a complete perfectionist is was Johnny was Johnny Wilkinson so you started working with him when he was when he was only 16 and kind of were able to to kind of craft him into the player who he was like what were the, the mindset um strengths that he had and more so the, and the traits that he had but more so how did you like figure out like how you were going to use his strengths to turn them into a you know, to, to, to work with him because obviously yeah. since he's played, he's, he's revealed that he's kind of had some, you know, mental health issues and stuff like that. So, you know, these things, I suppose, can go either way. If you work with, if you work with those traits, they can work for you. And if you, if you do the wrong thing, I suppose it can, it could turn into a negative. Yeah. I think um, it, it's really interesting because I, I, 
I, I met a sort of enthusiastic youngster who was pretty talented, but, but really determined to try and master something um, and was very humble. Um, that was very polite, uh, very courteous. Um, and, you know, after a couple of sessions, I said, okay, right, yep, I could do that. And he'd been identified by Rob Andrew um, as an heir apparent to Newcastle quite several years before Rob actually retired. So it was a kind of a long-term project that we, we identified. And then I kept working with him and then he would go up to Newcastle and I would see him when I was coaching at Newcastle and so on. So it kind of developed from there. Um, and I think um, we, we, we had, I wouldn't say disagreements, but there were several times when things were a bit rocky because more was more. And actually I'm learning now that less is more, um, but it's actually the quality and the intensity of the individual rep or, so, you, you know, so I, I've kind of moved on a lot. And I often wonder, you know, if I could meet Johnny again, you know, I would do things completely differently. But at the yeah. time I was doing the absolutely best I could with the knowledge that I had acquired at that point in time, remembering that I was still kind of coaching Rob Andrew at the same time. Yeah, yeah, but but I suppose in terms of him being a perfect, he 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 seems even in his in his punditry at the moment like he's complete perfectionist. Everything is to the detail, and I, I assume that you kind of would have. I assume he was like that from the off, but not every athlete you coach would be like that. So would you change your your approach depending on the human? Um, yeah, I. <sighs> There is actually, if I go through the people that I'm working with now, there are several real perfectionists. Mm. Um, you, you know that that um, uh, th there is a, a thing that I use in golf. Um, I ask a player to to uh, hit a shot, and then rather than tell me it's a good shot or not so good shot or, or, or whatever it is, I ask the player, okay, how much did that match your intention? And I'm looking at the shot, and I, I play myself. I'm not saying I'm an expert, but and I kind of go, well, gee, that looked a pretty good shot. That was probably a nine or a 10. And they'll come back to me and said, ah, oh, that was about a seven. And then I find out they're really hard on themselves, you know, and it kind of gives me the early warning. I said, well, okay, so what would make that into an eight? You know, and, and we yeah. kind of barter it. And sometimes I might move it up for them, you know. <laughs> um, so so it, it's, it, it's, it's very, very much individual. But the principle is that wherever the individual is at their margin, they try and get better than they were before. Okay. And, and I'm working with a couple of youngsters now, um, one not quite such a youngster now, uh, Thomas Taylor. And, and I, I worked with him, started much younger. He, he was 11, nearly 12 when I started with him. And, and, and we've looked as kicking and rugby as a metaphor for life. And he's he's developed into a, a fine young player at rugby school at the moment, um, but I, I think he's he's going to be an exceptional player wherever he ends up mm. playing. But it's been the attitude of going out, practicing, enjoying it, learning to celebrate when it's right, and you, you know you you have to be kind to yourself as well as being hard on yourself. Um, yeah. and, and this is something that a lot of people aren't. You get that, particularly today, you get into negative avoidance very, very quickly. In that, there's more emphasis on not missing than there is on achieving. And, and I kind of want to swing that round the other way if I if I can. Yeah, yeah. I suppose in in GA Gaelic games in Ireland at the moment, you see that a lot with um, even sporting teams and the way that they play. It's a very kind of a negative. There's a, a very kind of negative, fearful kind of approach, but it's a, it's a very hard thing to break that. But I suppose that the, the best way to break that is to improve the actual skill sets. So you can have confidence in that. Yeah, and I also think it's there's an attitude on the skill set. Um, I mean, it's quite interesting, isn't it? When teams are playing uh, and, and they get a lead, you hear them often say, oh, we sat on the lead a little bit. We, 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 we hung back a little bit and then they came at us and then they had the momentum and in the end, you know, we lost by a goal or, or whatever, whatever it is. Um, and I think that we, 
well, it's it's it is very difficult not to do something. And uh, what I mean by that is, you know, if you if you got a three foot putt, the worst thing somebody could say is it's three foot. For God's sake, don't miss it. You know, it, it, you know, and and I know of firsthand a, an international rugby coach handing the player to the tee, which I disagree with anyway. No kicking coach should ever go and handle hand the, the tee to the player and say, "Don't miss, we need this one." Yeah. Uh, and I, I I absolutely cringe when I when I heard that, and and it is. It, that says more about the coach and the anxiety of the coach than it does about the coach supporting the player to try to achieve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I suppose um, we'll get kind of more into the the them kind of details on because you have the chapter on language in your in your in your book is it's fantastic in terms of that kind of stuff and and even the body language. But with with the body language and you've got Johnny Wilkinson's fa- famous hands out and the little pip, the little squat pivot. Um, I was reading um, on how you kind of talk a lot about centering and you got that from judo and from baseball. And I, I never quite understood, though, the, the concept of the centering, really. If you kind of explain well, that for, for a kick and how yeah, it's, it's, well, it, it, it's, it's nearly everything, actually. And, and I use it a lot. I don't actually call it centering, but I, I, I use the awareness of where our body weight is and our center of gravity, which is kind of two inches behind your navel. And, and often uh, when people are under pressure, let's, let's just take kicking, for example, um, unless you're a Cristiano Ronaldo, who's got unbelievable stance and centering, although it's not, it's not as um, uh, obvious, but if you look at his impact position and his posture, his weight tends to be over impact. And that gives you a much, much heavier hit. So you're hitting with your body weight. A lot of people go up with the body, quit, and let the leg take over. And and straight away, A, it's a big strain on your body, but also um, it's not accurate because the leg is not, it can't go on forever. It's going to turn a corner. And that sends the ball out. So what happened? I I was still doing my PhD at the time. I I never forget the day. The actual day we did it was in Middlesbrough in an indoor stadium um, because we we worked at at Newcastle, but often the wind was so uh, difficult. So we we go once a week to this thing at Middlesbrough. And I had been looking at baseball and I'd been looking at some research about what does it take to hit a home run? And, and, you know, was it the most powerful, the fastest swing speed and blah, 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 you know, which is, which is kind of not unlike um, golf to a certain extent. And But then they go, well, why can little guys hit a home run? You, you know, it kind of doesn't make sense. And in fact, what, what the, 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 the issue is that it's how near your center of gravity is the impact. So if I hitting the ball, so if you imagine chopping a tree down, you will naturally stand with your navel opposite where you're going to hit the ax to the trunk. Yeah. You wouldn't yeah. stand dead in Way front back. of the tree because it's, it's too far away. I mean, this is a kind of real sort of obvious. And you wouldn't stand to the side because the, the ax would have done its fastest bit and then hit the tree. So you naturally do that when you're chopping a tree down but we're not aware of that when we kick, we don't use it. And, and yet we do if, if we're chopping something. So if you look at baseball and they looked at that and all the rest of it. So I looked at that and then at the same time, um, as I was kind of doing that, I got involved with judo and we looked at the issue of, I mean, judo essentially is a, is a, a tug, pull, push, get somebody off their center, uh, off their balance, get my center of gravity lower than yours, then attack you and throw you. That, that's, I mean, it's more than that, but that's essentially it, okay? So the awareness of the center of gravity and how easy you can throw somebody in terms of effort, that came into the whole notion of energy leak, et cetera, et cetera. So if you can imagine that amalgam of stuff, 
So I'm saying to Johnny, I said, Johnny, I just want you to have a little go at this. I want you to, I want you to kick the ball with your navel. And what I mean by that is I want you to just get your navel to go to the ball and the kick afterwards and then just jog through it. And we, we played around with it. And, and, it, and there was a sort of a realization of, wow, it goes further, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it, it does, because we've suddenly got very precise about where the center of gravity is and, and so on. And a lot of people have mimicked it, but they don't understand what it is that we're actually trying to do. You don't need to have your hands like that to do it, but it's the awareness of the center of gravity, which is two inches behind your navel. Can you get that opposite impact and be over the ball and be able to dominate the strike? And it's that is the crucial thing. And um, we played around with ideas and he said, well, imagine if I had a stake and, and uh, pushed it in my navel that right. OK, I can kind of see that. So we, we, we played around with ideas and and then, of course, everybody mimics it, but nobody understands it, which I do have a chuckle about. But, but it is an issue about center of gravity over impact on the strike. And that's the crucial bit. and that in golf. If you look at it, if you look at pros and you slow down the swing, particularly with irons, that's where they crush the ball, but it's right under their center of gravity with their okay. hands forward. And that's called the heavy hit. And, yeah, yeah. You know, so there's a sort of a, uh, a similarity going all through this. Hmm. I, I suppose kind of staying with, um, you know, well, not, not kind of staying with the theme of Wilkinson and the way that you worked with him through 16 and onwards to like the great success that he had with the Rugby World Cup in 03. And uh, we have a question from Matt Murphy, who's a youth football coach. And he's asking, um, he says, I've seen many sports people of all ages taste success and then let that go to their heads, leading them to make poor decisions driven by too much ego. Any suggestion on how they could manage to stay grounded? Yeah, I think uh, I, that's a really good question. And I think that I, I hear coaches say that so-and-so player He's forgotten how to learn. He's had too much too early and, and he thinks he's got all the answers and, and, and sport is littered with people that have dropped out. Some have rebuilt themselves and come back in again and so on. And I think that it, that's where the approach of, you know, looking at world greats, that they stay world great because of their humility and constant willingness to learn you just look at somebody like Roger Federer, you know, who's been, seems to be around for years, but he constantly is wanting to learn. You know, he's even changed coaches, not his main coach, but a, a particular coach to work on clay. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really lucky working with James O'Connor right now, who's kind of in his sort of uh, reborn mode, again, with the Queensland Reds, you know, and, and he is really humble desperate to learn um, and uh, I don't know but my understanding is that that wasn't always the case but you know he he's he's been brilliant and I think other people have looked at that and youngsters need to look at that and say right okay do I just want to be a flashy pan tonight or to Saturday or do I want to be a constant improver and be a, a stalwart of any organization that I'm part of. And I would put George Ford in that same, same category and Johnny Sexton. Uh, people tend to, you, you know, I, I know Johnny is, is, is often combating injuries and bits and pieces, but there is, that there is a, a, a singular burning flame. And every time I see him, we're changing bits and pieces you know, and he understands why, right, yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, we could try that, you know, and, and, and so on. And, and that's, that's testament to the character of the person and, and his absolute commitment to keep getting better. I think from a coaching perspective, though, and like I, I know myself from playing, the coach is the kind of you that you kind of, you need to trust the coach essentially. And you obviously do you try and work very much on building up that relationship or do you find that just by your it, it's so obvious what your actually your absolute interest in them and the time you put in and the care that you have that, that just that relationship just comes automatically yeah i I'd, I'd like to think so i mean i i, I definitely uh 
spend time coaching with the person, not just the sport. Uh, you, you know, and, and, and you often talk about all sorts of things in life and, you know, any issues and, and so on and so forth. And uh, tell some good jokes. And I know that seems really a bit, you know, you're joking, you know, yeah, but, but, but um, uh, I remember a couple of times that both Wilkinson and myself at Penny Hill Park in a freezing cold actually got cramp laughing. And very few people would say, you are kidding. I said, no, 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 no. Um, and, and we used to re recount incredible sketches with Marty Feldman, which is a, an offbeat comedian from way back. But, you, you know, that those are those are important, that they really are important nuggets and they're great icebreakers and breaking and, and just and then you can get back to it again. Yeah, yeah. I, I suppose even in your kind of examples that you give and the, the book is phenomenal for that because you give examples of different sports and like even business and life situations and different people you've dealt with. But like uh, the people who are tuning in here and, and, and who are watching, you know, we've got players, coaches, people like athletes, GA players, rugby players, soccer players. Um, in terms of your your coaching background, as we said, again, you, you've dealt with such a variety. It, is that because the fundamentals and even the mechanic side, the principles in so many sports are, are essentially the same? And how much research do you have to do into individual sports when you do go into them newly? Well, it, it, you know, you, you are you are so right that actually, I, I mean, luckily, all the sports, apart from judo, I suppose, they've all involved a ball and either hitting it, kicking it, throwing it or, or, or something. So the basic mechanics of, of big parts first and then little parts to finish off with um, is, is, is essentially the same. And we also know that under pressure, the big parts freeze and the little parts take over. And that's how we snatch and speed up and, and so on. So there is that. But, but I actually think the, the, the science, if, there is, if it is a science, the science of improving on your previous self is common to every athlete. And, 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 it, it, and, and if you're always saying... Now, just think if we could do, and, and there's a kind of almost childlike excitement about wanting to get better. You know, just imagine, you know, if I can spin past to you straight away, and you could do alternate kicks, right foot spiral, uh, left foot spiral, right foot spiral, left foot spiral. You know, how good would you do if I could give you four shots and all four balls were still rolling at the end of it? You know, in other words, you hit it that quickly, you know, yeah. and, and, and you kind of, uh, let's try it. Let's, and then that's, you kind of, you go way past the place that you need to be in the game. And then you start helping them technically because that's where it will break down and show itself because it's under extreme pressure, even if it's just the pressure of time. And it, it's that enthusiasm, I, I think, is you, you're trying to get it to be contagious, and once they catch it, then it, it you know, they, they kind of, I mean, I, I, I mean, it's, I don't know how common knowledge is, but George Ford is doing spiral bombs at the moment and everybody's going, to, but it's been a green work on for George for about four years. And everybody's just thinking, well, no, we've been doing this for four years. We, we've been practicing this. And, 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 and if, you, if you can get the spiral bomb and the low spiral, then it just means your kicking is much pure throughout the whole arc. So it's a kind of a natural progression. Um, but it's, uh, it, it, it's people don't realize that. You know, it, it, I, I saw a fantastic picture of an iceberg and it showed the top of it. So elite performance, wow. And then underneath it talked about commitment, anxiety, frustration, tiredness, injury, blah, 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 blah. all of that stuff goes on. And, and, and that's what I, what I end up managing. When you talk about um, in the book about practice, the, the kind of three phases, the three kind of stages that, that you talk about and kind of, I suppose you, you might have, uh, you have a kind of a, a different kind of name, but it's, well, I kind of would see is the ugly zone kind of repetitions and then practicing for match performance, kind of the three stages kind of of it. And like, would you be able to kind of elaborate a bit on, on those? And also how do you fit those into your season? So like, would you have, would you recommend for a guy who's 
in the middle of, of league um, to be practicing the uglies on because that I assume that's going to not be best for the confidence. Well, it, yeah, it's it's yeah. I mean, it's basically repair training match, and yeah. the ugly zone is at any point where you can't quite achieve it. So if, if I did a simple thing, let's just say we're looking at goal kicking for Gaelic, all right? I'm very comfortable with my right foot, okay? I'm struggling with my left foot. Uh, I can get two or three, and as long as I get a little bit closer and I get my body through impact, I, I can kind of get it there. I would say that's your ugly zone, and you should be working on that as well, because you never know the day when you are going to have to get rid of it on your, on your left foot, you see? Uh, the right side repair technically is pretty sound. So that's okay. Then we have training, which is the number of reps, right? How many out of five can you get? Or how long, how many does it take you to get five from a narrow angle? Um, you, you know, let's say you're a right footed uh, kicker and you want to really work on your accuracy. If you went 10 yards from the goal line, and you were kind of 10 yards from the touch line and you're right footed, you naturally will curve it across the goal. And my challenge to you is, can you get a backspin drive to go straight? And, and that would, would be ugly to do, but you'd be amazed at how many people can do it when they kind of accept that and, and prepared to rep it, you know? Um, and then of course, obviously on the left side, it's lovely because you've got a, a curve in and so on. But I think that a lot of people look for a steady state to go into competition. And my experience is, and, and this comes from the kind of Marines bit, if, and, and it was actually when I first joined England uh, way back with Jack Rao, and there was a big thing about in test week, we don't do anything new. Uh, test week is test week, oh. we don't do anything new. And, and, and it was incredibly predictable. You know, we had a timetable, we knew where everything was, and, and probably the, 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 the biggest hoo-ha was if lunch was late. You know, I mean, it was, and, and then I, I remember going to the Marines and their whole thing is in combat, and I suppose a match is combat because it's unpredictable. You might know the team, but you don't know how they're gonna play. You don't know the conditions and so on, okay? If, if, if your environment is dynamic and unpredictable, then you should have training that is dynamic and unpredictable. Otherwise, you're going to learn the skill in an environment that's not relevant to the match. Um, and and that, that's quite a kind of ruffling the feathers a little bit. And also, if the brain is prickly and people are a little bit edgy and a little bit, oh, oh, rest of it, they are in a far better place to cope with unpredictability than if everything is just so I've done it, I've done my five kicks to my right, my five kicks to my left, we always do it, you know, we always hit three, uh, three, three on the right, three on the left with the tackle bags and so on and so forth. And yet, as soon as that whistle goes, all bets are off. It's totally unpredictable. It's random. It's chaotic. Yeah. So how do we go from order and expect to perform in chaos? So I yeah. kind of leave that. And, and that's a, a really kind of, and I'm always grappling with that in my mind as well. Yeah. So I suppose that, that period of a, of a season when players go out and just kind of look for that, I suppose that easy confidence session where you just go out and kick 10 balls and you score them all and you feel great and you come away and you're like, geez, I'm kicking really well. Or in golf with your, with your swing or, or basketball or getting all of the easy shots and feeling great. You don't really kind of focus on that too much because, as you said, that's not match related. Yeah. I so would I look that's... on that technically. There's a place for it to do that technically. But I would not have that as my, let's just do some good shots to feel good. I, yeah. I'd rather, let's have some blood on the floor, mate, because that's what it's going to be like. Yeah. I, I, I give you an experience, which I, 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 I was involved in Bath, and it was the days when the Auckland grid was a real big thing in rugby union, which was kind of formation, running and passing. And we played against Benetton, and the coach of Benetton at that time was a guy called Villepreux, a Frenchman that was way, way ahead of his time. 
And I never forget it because we did this Auckland grid in front of the crowd and the crowd were loving it and everybody's hooping and hiring and balls flinging everywhere and all so not a drop ball and everybody, hey, and they, even the crowd applauded the warm up kind of thing, you know? Mm. The Italians were down the other end playing tick and pass, covered in mud, complete mess in a little tiny square, utter chaos, just like kids in a mud bath, okay? All right? By half time, we were 20 points down. We'd never touched the ball. Yeah. I never forget that as, as a lesson. Yeah. They had already played, in terms of behavior, that was an extension of the preparation. In terms of behavior for Bath at that time, it was totally alien to the preparation. Yeah, yeah. It, it's interesting. I, I, and I suppose what, what you're trying to do then is to actually build up a real conf confidence rather than a superficial confidence. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you're obviously trying to, you're talking about constant improvement. Would you be more in favour of maximising um, what somebody already has and the, the skills they already have or really hammering out weaknesses? Both. Both. It's, it's quite interesting when, when people say, you know, I need to improve on this. When I, uh, I won't say who the golfer was, but I, I remember talking to a golfer and I said, well, OK, so just talk to me about your game. And, and, and I got, well, my putting is really bad. My chipping is horrible. I'm, really, you know, uh, mm. and I was sort of waiting for this. And I, I was kind of joking with him. I said, well, I don't know whether to slash my wrist now or, or <laughs> you, you know, to, to tell me what you're good at. But, but, but that was so, so typical. So um, I would rather say, well, well, let's improve on everything because it's quite interesting. If you just improve on a perceived weakness, you're making it obvious that it's a weakness. Okay. Do, do, yeah. I would rather just let's get better at everything and let's get used to improving. And the skill of improving we're going to imply that to all the stuff. And there are going to be some areas that we're not so good at. That's fine. We'll just keep going at that. And there are going to be areas that we are pretty professional, but let's try and get a even get a little bit better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes makes sense. Uh, I suppose going with the, the mechanics, say ball striking out of the hand, like what would be the key? Uh, I suppose that comes into the, the spiral kick, but then for GA, just the general kick. Like what are the fundamentals that you would, that you would um, suggest? I... I, I <laughs> I think one of the most important things uh, with kicking um, out of hand is that you learn to kick jogging. You don't waste time kicking standing still. Now, a lot of people disagree with that and they go, well, no, hang on, let's get the skill right and let's start jogging. No, because what happens is when you kick stationary, you're getting the pillar to stop. And we actually want the pillar as part of the movement so that we get the pillar moving and then the leg on top of it. So that's the kind of kinetic chain that we're after. If you suddenly say, right, we're just going to do the bottom bit of that, the, the leg, I'm going, no, please don't. Please don't. Because what you're doing, you're ingraining a behavior that you want to avoid. So if you could just jog, I mean, you can just jog short steps start jogging through let your body go through the ball think of think of kicking as kicking with your body first get control of the ball and then work on what i call line and strike in other words get the line right and the strike and here's a really interesting thing which i've i've used a lot particularly in the last two years which is about how long i've been here I brought in this idea of learning at 40% effort. And the reason is this. If you were to kick at 40% effort, a Gaelic football, and you had to kick it to a target, that would be quite tough. Okay. Now, why is it tough? It's tough because if you kick at 40%, the compression on the ball on impact isn't very wide at all it's hardly going to dent the ball. So the surface area that you're hitting with is quite narrow. If I smash it and really belt it, then the surface area is a lot bigger and it kind of disguises the mistakes because you're hitting it. It's, it's, it's like, uh, I, I can't think of it. it, it it's probably like um, hitting a cricket ball, you know, with a tennis racket. 
you know, it's, it's, it's not helping and you can whack it as hard as you like and, and it's okay, it might not be exactly right. But if you could learn to control strike and line with body going through at 40%, so you're just touching, but touching the ball precisely in the way you want the ball to go, the learning is dramatic. It's frustrating, but the learning is dramatic. And then when you do come to belt the ball, you suddenly find, gosh, I, I, I probably put 60% in that, 65%, and the ball just went. But yeah. it, it, it's built on that 40%, which is, which is tough for the reasons I explained about the lack of compression. And, and I suppose then, similarly, we have, we have hurlers here and, and, and then, but it's the same in rugby, more so soccer Gaelic, in terms of working on your weaker side. Um, and that's something that you, you obviously bring in. Like, what would be the fundamentals that you would bring in in terms of that? Because you always talk in your book about feel. And I suppose that's a massive part about using your weaker side because you, you wouldn't have the natural feel from, obviously, if you haven't worked on it from a young age. Absolutely. I mean, and the other thing is, is if you're working on your, on your uh, weaker side, it's very important to reassess your expectation as to what you're trying to achieve. So if, if I was weak, uh, let's say I was working with a rugby player and he, and he can do a drop punt and he can kick it comfortably 40 yards. Okay, so from the try line to the, uh, to the 10 meter. I say, right, now we're gonna work on the left foot. I don't want it to go further than the 22. So I've taken the distance out. It's now technique. And now I can take my time and give myself space to learn rather than try and manufacture something just because I'm obsessed to get it the same distance as my right. And over time, you can start extending that. But so many people go straight in. There's my right foot, right? I'm going to smash this with my left foot. Gosh, that felt horrible. A little bit of a groin strain. Oh, I'm not going to do that again. Um, and, and the other way... Um, is to kick into a net or against a wall that's only 10, 12 feet away from you and just learn the feel of it, you know, with, with no worry about the outcome. Yeah, yeah. And Johnny Wilkinson's famous drop goal was with his, his weaker foot. Yes. When you talk about the, the, the fundamentals in the book, the eight principles that you have, one of them is language. So just kind of touch on that a bit and um, to kind of, I suppose the interesting things I find in that is kind of body language, but also I suppose your, your, your self-talk as well. And you talk about affirmations and stuff like that. Yeah, I think language is really important. And I, I, I have a little bit of a crusade on this. I think that on a lot of coaching courses, there's not enough time equipping coaches with the skill of using effective language to try and, and, and help people. I mean, if you, if you go into any changing room, it, it, anywhere in, in the UK or, or Ireland and you listen to the halftime talk or the, or the beginning of the talk, you'll hear things like no drop passes, you know, make sure there's no missed tackles, um, probably a lot more colorful than that, but you, you know, and all of those are deletions and, and the brain fundamentally doesn't work on deletions because if you think of the brain you get the you say right the guy said no drop passes right let me think about it drop pass yeah i can clearly see exactly what he means yep yeah, there's the ball dropping on the ground now i mustn't do that now if i say it like that you go oh well, hang on that's stupid whereas just a little bit of thought let's make sure every pass goes to hand now, just a little bit of thought and understanding that you're always trying to ask players to do something rather than try and avoid something. So if you just had that, that would help coaching dramatically. And the, and the other point of it is, is when you get the kind of hard um, get stuck in. I mean, you say, I hear that, you know, shouted out an 11 year old playing mini rugby. Well, what does that actually mean? You, you know, it, it, and, and it, it's such a shame because I actually think that in that, you know, mums and dads love to get involved in minis, eight to about 11, and then they go to secondary school and so on. And, and there's a massive drop off from the games, from all games then. And I'm sure a lot of it is, I don't like being shouted at. 
I don't like being, you, you know. Whereas if somebody could just tell kids how to do something and let them do it, you, you know, and it, and in, and enjoy that, then I think we would have a, a a bigger cohort of people coming through. And in in terms then of the actual, um, that's the coaches kind of talking. The players input themselves, I suppose, is their their own self talk and visualization and stuff like that in their own practice on their own, and then that comes into. So how do you kind well, of they, well, well they they hear that as well. So they're they're running out on the pitch, going right, no miss passes, and and I'm actually saying, well, okay, you, you, your your self talk should be, what are you doing? How are you doing it? So it might be, let's just say it's a rugby ball. It might be all right, grip. I want to feel the ball. I want to feel the fingertips on the on the the pimples and so on. All right, and then hands to target, grip, hands to target. You know, uh, but it's always doing something. You, you, you know, and that's the crucial part of it. Um, and, and then when you do something well, like you've hit a kick, and we all know we have this famous saying in the kicking school. We actually go, only kickers know. It's the feeling you get when you've absolutely laced something and it's gone really well and there's absolutely no energy leak at all. It's all gone through the ball. That wonderful, sublime feeling, you know, but do we congratulate ourselves? No, we don't. We go, yeah, yeah, it was all right. But then we beat ourselves up when we slice it. So we, we kind of need to adjust this. And we kind of need to have our, our self-talk that says, what do I need to do differently from that shot that was sliced? And how good was that one where I nailed it with no energy leak? And if you can get that reverse, then you'll get a much more productive player, individual, and hopefully somebody that will in, enjoy them, themselves. I mean, golf is, a, is, is an absolute cracker for negative avoidance and self-talk question here we have from a, a pro rugby player who, who's asked if you have an athlete who has lost confidence in his her ability and his her performance has dropped how do you go about restoring that confidence in themselves and especially their belief in their game um that's a really good question i mean ironically yes there, there's actually two people that i'm working with at the moment remotely and and we're going back to find to basically identify what they can do what they can do well and then put in, if you like, simple things under pressure and then build from the ground up and have our expectations about a very basic game. So if, for example, so the, the chap's a rugby player there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So if, if for example, uh, let's just suppose um, that he's a, I'm going to call him a fly half, for example, and he, he kicks with both feet and his left foot. Now, okay, just kick with your right foot. In other words, go into an area. I, I have this saying that I, I often use to players, particularly when there's a big game, make sure you play within yourself. And, and, and that has a metaphor of, you know, make sure that when you place the ball, it's within the environment that you can control. Don't think I'm going to do, I'm going to do the biggest kick ever now. And you've never done it before. You, you should always be in a position where there's nothing I'm going to do today that I haven't already done. Now that, that has implications on how you practice agreed, but at least when you say that, and you know that, okay, then you, then you start getting confidence in what you're capable of doing because you've done it. So it, it's a kind of building blocks again. And, and, and when we come to the areas that are difficult, then we work on that technically, but we keep working on all the others. So that's, that's the best way. I, I would not see it as a quick fix, you know, right? It, he's, he's fallen to bits because he can't kick with his left foot. I would just say, hang on, hang on. It, yes, that may be... Uh, if you like a symptom, but let's let's look at the whole thing and start identifying what we do well as our starting point. And then you kind of so you're essentially starting at a surface level again and building it back up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. with yeah, solid yeah. foundation. And, the, and and the athlete has to recognise when it's right. Yeah, that's really important. You know, not keep looking for what's wrong you know, start looking at what's right. I mean, once you get into negative avoidance, in other words, I'd rather not make a mistake 
than trying to achieve, that then that that really does cap people's ability to improve. And having that as kind of a, a constant principle throughout your your coaching with the player, is that the way you would you would prepare them for say a, a really mi- a ba- bad miss kick or like a really bad uh, passage of play or uh, playing a really bad start to a game or something like that? Or do you have a few cues for players and how they can recover from a really bad part of a game and then a bad performance on for the next game? Well, I, I think. You know, how many times have we have we played against a team or seen a team uh, really do well against another team? And we sit down and we analyse them and we actually go, do you know what? They didn't do anything special. They just did the simple things very well at pace. And I think sometimes we, we go into bad patches or we go into areas that we're trying stuff that we're not competent at. So I would kind of bring it back i mean with young kids in a rugby environment you often find they're standing too far apart so the, they're, they're trying to pass too far they're just not capable of it. so get them closer together let's let's get some bits of, and it's 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 difficult because if they're young you know you're, you're trying to put an old head out there but it, it's trying to encourage them to see that themselves you know what can you yeah. do well right let's do that rather than try and do something that you're mm. not sure about just because you're trying to get back into the game. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you're trying to put an old head on the young head and then you're trying to put a young head on an old head. That's Sometimes right, yeah. To, you're head. exactly yeah. right there, yes. Yeah. yeah. What, one of the, the brilliant um, stories or uh, examples I found you gave in the book was when you kind of compare golf and skateboard. And I just found it fascinating when you were talking about how golf as a sport and all of the books and manuals about it and then you have a sport which is very complex and is quite dangerous in skateboarding and like failure is a badge of honor and failure is almost celebrated you kind of can you kind of explain for that anyone who hasn't read the book or kind of yeah i just well i find it fascinating that um with with skateboarding you you know people uh, infuse about their wipeouts which is when they've fallen off and they kind of describe vividly. My, my son went through this when, um, when he was about 11, 12. And uh, I remember him buying a new pair of jeans and then he got some sandpaper out of the garage and wore the knees out straight away. And I said, well, what are you doing that for? And he said, Let, you've, got to, you've got to show that you've fallen. It's really important. You've got holes in your knees, you know, with it, you know, because <laughs> otherwise... And I'm going, right, okay. But I found it fascinating. And then when his mates came around, they were talking about the crashes and the stuff that they did and, you know, had a great pirouette. I did this, whatever it was. And then I fell off and I rolled down. I I went into the dustbin and that fell on the floor and and so on. And, and, And I just think, wow, okay, that's why there's kind of unfettered learning. It's just happens. It's it's a kind of a, a purist, see it. I'll have a go at that. Now, what did you do? Right. Okay. Right. I'll try that. You know, I'll try it. I'll try it. I'll try it. In golf, it's totally the other way. You know, there are manuals and manuals and manuals written on get the club face to be facing to the target when it hits the ball. Um, and, and all the things that can go wrong with it. And, and, and we, we make something incredibly complex, but it's all about negative avoidance. You know, nobody celebrates, you know, going into the water. And in fact, we go the other way. We actually try and avoid the water at all costs, which is why it goes in the water. Uh, mm. um, you know, and, 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 and we don't, w- without understanding what's going on, we're not productive enough to go actually to not go in the water. I need to focus on what I'm doing, not what I'm trying to avoid. So it would really have the bottom of the flag absolutely in your mind's eye before you swing and and hit the ball. And you would connect a particular dimple on the ball to the target. So I'm on and I've got so much going on that I, I haven't got room to actually recognize or see or take into account the water. Mm. Uh, we have a question in here from uh, the former Kerry player, William Kirby, who was a, a great uh, Gaelic football midfielder. And he asks, 
Um, how do, how do you get players to stop giving out to referees during a match? Is a big problem in the GEA. I suppose that's kind of staying on with the language principle. Yeah, I um, that's a that's a real uh, uh, it's it's a shame that it, that's an issue. I. I've heard uh, soccer coaches of young kids saying that if you if he gives out to the referee, I'm going to take him off straight away. I actually think that if you could, it depends on the age of the of the players, but I see that as a weakness. And and if the players perceive that you see it as a weakness, it is a weakness. In other words, you can't cope with the unpredictability. Um, you can't cope with something that doesn't exactly go your way then chances are you're not going to have the resilience that's going to be needed to go to the top of the game anyway. So I think if it was kind of packaged like that, and you actually say, you know, to me, I, I just want players to go, okay, ref, get on with it and get back and get on to the next job, rather than, you know, as you say, give it out to the referee all the time and so on. And it might be an instant bravado initially it might make, make the player feel a bit better um but in the long term I, I don't think it's going to do any good so if you can kind of say it is a weakness and, and i don't know how many players he's got in his squad and so on but you know they I, I'd, I'd actually if i could i'd take the player off um when, when you talk in the book about um anxiety and you talk about kind of trade and anxiety for excitement essentially um, like how how do you kind of suggest to do that in in in, in the, the first steps? Well, I think I think one of the things is that when people are anxious, their 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 body changes, um, and it, and it's interesting if you look at um, guys that take penalties in soccer. You know the penalty shootout, the proverbial, you know the long walk, and 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 how they're fighting this anxiety with um you know holding their posture and so on and that the the body doesn't really know whether it's anxious or excitement it's kind of the same stuff all going on but if you can actually i know this is going to sound strange but enjoy the discomfort and kind of stand tall you know, there's this thing, fake it till you make it kind of, but, you know, stand tall, then that anxiety is actually fuel for performance because it's adrenaline and so on. You know, it's, it's getting ready uh, for something that's unpredictable, the kind of towards the fight and flight bit. But if we can take that energy, we can direct it into, into a, a lot of stuff. I mean, I, I've been involved in, in environments where players uh, or one particular player was throwing up in the toilet before the game. It was that anxious. And, and I often thought, you know, I wonder if I just went up to him and said, hey, don't worry, you don't have to play. You know, I, it probably hit me because he wants to play more than anything. And this, uh -huh. you, you know, so it, it, it is, um, uh, and, and actually this particular player, you know, when he when he did play, particularly goal kicking, you know, he, he was people called him as cool as ice. Uh, it wasn't, but it, but he he worked out a way of, of managing it. Um, and and Jack Nicholas has actually said that you know he he could not have won so many majors without feeling almost sick with worry. But then you you know just your demeanor, your posture, your posture is also biomechanically more sound as well as emotionally giving yourself a sense of command and so on so it's a kind of mixture of stuff but but if you if you act the part even though it might not feel it at the time mm. um then that will take you a long way to getting there and it's kind of a, perce a perception then as well that like this is this is fuel rather than this is going to this Absolutely. is going to make me better rather than it's going to make me worse Absolutely. Yeah. If it feels uncomfortable, it's a bit like the old days, you know, when no medicine was any good for you if it tasted good. So if you had a really, really horrible medicine, then it would do you a lot of good. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I think <laughs> anxiety is a bit like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you talk about celebrating success and um, positive reinforcement and, and these kind of things, can you kind of... Um, differentiate that and just kind of I suppose in the modern world there's a lot of positive talk for the sake of positive talk 
and I suppose there is a there is a big difference because a lot of people are like well, I don't want to hear that that's negative where you do bring people into the ugly zone as you said and you do want to kind of challenge people and constantly be questioning and challenging but at the same time you don't want to have a ne- negativity around so how do you strike that balance between I suppose yeah. superficial confidence and real confidence yeah that's a really good question I mean first of all uh, I, I agree with you that um, people who want to be positive have a lot of positive language and you know everything's great that's wonderful that's wow you know and all the rest of it even though the player themselves know I didn't hit that well I know that wasn't a good kick why are you telling me that's a good kick and so on so if you change positive language to productive language and productive language goes that's good and why so if for example you know you're you're taking a free shot okay and you hit it with a thin foot and it goes out to the left okay what i need to do is to find out what was right about that first before I ask you if you could roll your quad round to get more of your laces on the ball, then you'll be able to collect more of the ball and that wouldn't have escaped out to the right. But your posture was really good. The way your left shoulder was leading was absolutely mm. outstanding. So I, that's what I mean by, and I, I, I understand, I don't like positive too much, but I, I think productive is, is much, much better. Yeah. So the difference and, and so, between saying that's really good and then rather than saying you did this really well, rather than yeah. just saying, oh, really good, but <laughs> that's really. it. You, you, you did this really well. OK, the reason it went out to the side, your foot was a bit thin. So now we come back to what do you need to do differently? Roll your quad round so that if you like your knee is facing the goal rather than the inside of your knee. Now you can get a broader foot on the ball. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, so the guy feels good about something and he's prepared to have a go. And that's, that's how you invite people in the ugly zone because they may not get the rolling quad straight away. They get frustrated, but they've got to hang on to the bits that they do well. Um, kind of staying with mindset, um, we have a question in about retirement. Um, the question is, what, if anything, should elite athletes do to prepare for their retirement from their chosen sport? when they are performing at the highest level? I think it's a, that's a, a great, a great question. Uh, and, I, and I wish there was more, um, more thought put, put into that. I mean, clearly, you know, some players uh, might find that coaching is cut out for them. But I think the issue is that when, when you're playing at your elite level, you're constantly trying to improve. And then once you are not playing, there's no reason to improve because you're not there. And I think that's, that's the whole. Now, I know this is going to sound corny, but I'd say, right, number one, take up golf a year before you're going to retire and, and get yourself competitive. I mean, golf is an incredible game. It, it, you know, it's not physically demanding, although it can be if you decide to get fit and, and all the rest of it, okay? But there's always something to work on. It's social, so you're not on your own. You're always having to improve. You know, I'm not saying that you, you, you're going to qualify for the British Open and all that sort of stuff. That's not what I'm saying. It's just enjoyment. And enjoyment in a kind of competitive environment that you yourself are getting better than you were last week or two weeks ago. And it's massively frustrating. But I think that can, can do, go some way to kind of consuming the competitiveness that you, you're going to lack. Now, it may not be golf, but I mean, clearly, I mean, some guys take up running, some guys take up triathlon, you know, which is great. The, what, the reason why I say golf is that if you've got injury or you, you, you know, you're not as fit or whatever, then golf you can do. But I would get involved in something that you can improve on yourself. And, and yeah. that's, that's the crucial part for me. I suppose when we're talking about all these different um, elements of like self-talk or practice and like there's a lot of information and I suppose when you're given players when you're coaching players you're, you're you are giving them a lot of information you you kind of use the, the you reference sensory overload so in terms of when you're doing all of this practice and the player goes out into the field how do you avoid sense, sensory overload which i suppose is overthinking or like being out there thinking right i have to do this 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 because 
that that might be fine for goal kicking, but especially in like some context of like in play environments when there's so many, you know, things that can change. How how do you avoid that? I think well, you're right, but often um, if you if you look at implicit explicit learning. And, and, and the explicit learning is telling them every detail. And implicit learning is, is kind of conditioning. So you set a condition. So if, for example, I, I, I want you to practice some low kicks now, okay? So what I'm gonna ask you to do is I'm gonna pick a spot 20 meters to the side, 20 meters from the post. I want you to kick under the crossbar, but it must land over the goal line. There's a challenge for you. You'll find a way of doing that. And you, you will kind of teach yourself to hit a low, hard kick. Mm. And then if it's not hard enough, I might say, right, now I'm going to put a goalkeeper in there. So can you beat them? So I, I've changed the conditions. So it's the environment that actually coaches you. So when we're in a game and, and we want a low, hard kick into the corner, you just do it. Yeah. Because when you learnt it, it was a question of just doing it. It wasn't a question of a, of a lot of bits and pieces. And it, 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 although if, if you wrote everything down about goal kicking, it would be very, very complex. OK, and, and there's a lot of it. And, and coaches need to know infinitely more than they ever say. Because the real nugget is is what what you're saying. You know, and you've thought it out. You go, right, okay. And, and the skill is to give them something to do where consciously they're doing one thing, but subconsciously they do three or four other things rather than tell them three or four other things. I think um, from, a, from a, a lot of the answers that you're given, a lot of the hard work is, well, it might sound obvious, but the, nearly all of the hard work is done in the practice. And then when you, as you're saying, when you're going out into the performance, you're performing within, within yourself. So you're not doing anything that you haven't practiced, but exactly. all of the yeah. hard work is done in the practice. And then when you perform, there's nothing new coming into it. So, so when you have that mentality, then there shouldn't really be much pressure because you're only, you're doing everything which you've already practiced so hard at. Yeah. yeah. And, and that, and that, that's exactly right. And, but a lot of players, you know, when you're kind of demanding that, I mean, luckily I don't come across many because if they are like this, I don't really hang around that much. A lot of them go, okay, yeah, but I know it was missed, but it was only practice. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm saying, no, no, no. And, 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 and you, you have to get it right in practice and actually get it right with a smaller margin than you are going to have to in the game. We have a good question in from Rob Henley, who's a really talented uh, Mayo goalkeeper. Um, he says, the pressure, the pressure Principle was the best book I've ever read to help me take understandable and actionable concepts into training and games and get results. Although it's not that long since you published it, if you were writing again tomorrow, is there anything you would add to it or perhaps put greater focus on? How, how have your coaching techniques or principles evolved over the last three to four years? It's really good, yeah. Um, the, the principles themselves, so implicit, explicit learning, about, uh, the environment, create the environment, keep self-esteem, you know, all of those things, uh, the behavior matching has, has stayed exactly the same. It's actually how I use them that, that's moved on. I would probably emphasize more on language now um, if I was to, to write it, uh, there's a kind of a, a tree that I've created and the, and the relationship of language and getting in the ugly zone. Um, uh, I, I, I think I, the other thing that I would add in now, I'd put a separate chapter in about how to be a good learner. Because uh, I think it's all very well, you know, having this is how you coach and blah, blah, blah. blah. Yeah. Nobody tells you how to be a good learner. You know, yeah. nobody, no, nobody tells you, said like, when you're told to do something, don't expect to get it right all the time. Pick one little bit of it. Try and get that right. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid at the end of the session saying, I'm still struggling with my left foot. Is there a practice I could do at home indoors? 
you know, and and kind of and I've I've kind of rumbled on this in the uh, working with Thomas, who was a, a, a real youngster. I keep saying to him all the time, "Look, Thomas, you know," and, and this is a twelve-year-old kid. I said, "Look, if I say anything, you have, and you don't understand it, you have to promise me you're going to ask it. You're going to ask." You must ask questions, mm. you know, and, and I found that, you know, really, I, I could have almost crafted that chapter with watching Thomas develop. Uh, he's now 17 now. Um, and obviously, if you're dealing with somebody like a, a Sexton or a Wilkinson, you know, they'll ask questions straight away. But that's not, but it's the, it's the kind of informative years if you could be a better learner, you would get there quicker. Yeah, so that's and, that's the only thing I would I would want to change. Yeah, because there is that is actually something which I suppose a lot of players would, would find interesting because you you kind of don't know how what's the level of how many questions you should be asking, and it seems as though you're not really listening. You're kind of almost telling the coach how you want to do it yourself. So it's yeah. kind of a, a balancing act. But we, we have another question in from Roan and Crean who asks. Has Dave ever worked with any professional footballers in perfecting a self-paced skill such as free kick taking? Um, I've done it with goalkeepers. Um, so you could say that uh, the, the kick off the spot um, was a self-paced. Um, and I worked a little bit um, with Joe Cole uh, when he was at Chelsea. But that was definitely, although... It wasn't really self-paced. It was actually on the ball, on the run, and covering it and, and trying to get shots away uh, with a, a with a very limited energy leak, um, and uh, and 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 quick. And that was about body over impact and and so on. But I've done quite a bit of goalkeeping work, um, and that is again it, it it manifests itself with the with the body getting through first and the leg coming afterwards um, so that the big parts are right. And then if the little parts aren't quite right, it still goes straight, but it may not go exactly in the, in the place you want it to. I suppose uh, we, we could keep you here all day. We've already been, been over an, an hour. I definitely could keep you here all day. <laughs> but um, the, fi the final question, I suppose, for me is that you talk about George Ford and working on his spiral kick for four years. And these things obviously don't happen overnight. And in, in that sense, it's, it's, it's a bit of a silly question, but if you had like a one day session with a high level athlete, what would be the, the, the go-to things that you would essentially try to work on to improve their performance under pressure? Um, it, it depends on the sport, obviously uh, a, a lot of it. I'd probably go back to the posture, uh, the expectation. It, I would probably be asking them more than telling them uh, to try and piece together something uh, to give them a format in, in, in which they can sort of a grid that they could work with. Um, I, I, it, it, it's difficult and is it self-paced and is it attitude and so on. I mean, one thing that I, I've done uh, with teams, players is actually when people come up to the, to the game they often kind of, uh, well, what am I going to do? And I, I, I get a piece of paper um, and I put it into four quarters. And on the first quarter on the left-hand side, I write down the challenges. So what are the challenges in this game? And it might be, you know, I have to mark this left winger. Then it's action. So opposite, I have to mark this left winger. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to constantly stand on his inside foot I'm going to force him out and blah, blah, blah. I must keep, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then what are the other challenges? And you list them down, you list the actions. And then the, the, the third quadrant of this is actually the mindset. So what is my mindset? What do I have to do? And it's, it'll probably be about posture. It'll probably be about fast feet. Um, it might be about feeding the ground. It, it, it can depend on, on, on the sport. Then you fold the piece of paper. And all you've got is that's what I'm going to do during the game. But it's actually me. This, this is me. The coach has actually yeah. said, we, we need to have intensity. We need to do this, this, it. But what does it mean for me? Um, and, 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 and that has been very useful. And if it's a, 
you know, an away game and you're in the hotel the night before and so on, get players to have this by the side of the bed, fold it over, and they actually find they can sleep better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's fantastic. It's really, really, really um, uh, fantastic and helpful and insightful. Um, as all of the podcasts, but I think we try to get as many questions as you as possible. Um, thanks, Winnie.